Welcome to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles in the second of my presentations on uh, the nature of capital hosted by Politics in Motion. My main topic this week will be the relationship between the mode of production of capital and the context of its social formation. In the first session, I talked very much about uh, how we might uh, approach uh, the analysis of a capitalist mode of production from the standpoint of uh, the emancipated labourer. Uh, now, I focused in that talk very much upon what I call the mode of production, which is what Marx calls the inner structure of capitalist society. Uh, and uh, But he used another term, and I'm going to actually clearly distinguish between the mode of production and the social formation. Now, a very curious thing about reading Marx is he very rarely uses the term capitalism. In fact, I can't find him using it anywhere. <laughs> but he does talk about capital as a mode of production. And he also, at various points, talks about the social formation which is, if you like, the contextual conditions within which a mode of production operates. The sort of analogy I use here is that the mode of production is a bit like the engine of, uh, of capitalism, uh, and it is the driving engine of, ca of, of the mode of production which Marx is primarily concerned to uh, pull apart and, and, and understand. But he recognises strongly that there is a, a significance of the social formation and that the social formation which exists around the mode of production is of great significance and therefore we need to do an analysis of the relationship between uh, the social formation and the mode of production. Now again, I will use an analogy here. Let us suppose that we want to write a book about human health. Well, one of the things we would do is we would talk about the human body and all the internal problems of uh, the human body, much in the way that I talked last time, talking and saying, well, the blood circulates uh, from the heart, the oxygen through the lungs, the energy through the gastro and Neurology kind of system, and that, 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 that therefore you could look at the human body and the health of the human body from the standpoint of all of those different circulatory processes. But everybody knows that that, that that human body exists in a certain environment, and the environmental conditions are terribly important for what happens to the human body. Uh, for example, if there is a, a mass unemployment and misery around and everybody starts taking opioids and people start dying of opioid uh, overdoses and so on, uh, we have a contextual condition, which is a social condition, which is terribly important in defining what human health is about. We may also find, as uh, exists in certain cases, that uh, capital is actually creating cancerous environments, and so there is, an, in Louisiana, for example, there's somewhere called uh, Cancer Alley, which is where all of the petrochemical industrial uh, activities occur, and the uh, contaminants in the air lead to uh, all kinds of environmental kind of problems. And there's a question of environmental injustices going on in, around, so, so that... Uh, uh, if, if we were interested in looking at uh, human morbidity and all the rest of it, we would have to say, well, we have to look at uh, conditions in society in general, uh, the pollutants in the atmosphere, the, uh, the contamination of food supplies, uh, the uh, results of, of uh, tornadoes from human uh, uh, contribution to human, uh, to, to, to global warming, things of that kind. So there, there are contextual conditions 
And in this way, Marx uh, actually does set up a uh, separation between the social formation, which is talking about the contextual conditions within which the mode of production operates. So if there is a crisis in the mode of production, it can either be because uh, there's something internally wrong with the human body or because some violation has occurred uh, in terms of external circumstances that contaminate, say, the food supply that, uh, or, or, or few food qualities such that uh, there are suddenly enormous concentrations of stomach cancers and esophagus campers, cancers and so on, which can clearly be traced to environmental degradations. So what are we primarily talking about here? And uh, within my own analysis, uh, what I do is to say, well, there are two major areas of concern. First is the relation to uh, the environment. And, and the environment, uh, we might want to distinguish between natural environment, that is the conditions which are prevailing no matter, no matter what human beings have done, and then there is the built environment, which is, an, an, uh, which is the physical transformation of the landscape, that has been done through human labor. And you look at what capital has done, you fly over the United States and you see all of the agribusiness fields and, and you fly over and you see the cities and you see all this kind of thing and you kind of say, this is not a natural environment in the sense uh, that it was there all the time and that therefore we're dealing with the, the, the creation of, of uh, what Marx sometimes called a second nature which is that environment which is reorganized according to uh, human, what human beings have done to it. And there's a long history of this, of course, because the clearing of the fields and the clearing of the forests, the building of the, of the polders and Netherlands and the, the drainage and all the rest of it, this has been going on for, for three, four hundred years now. And these massive transformations that have occurred uh, are then create a different context in which capital accumulation can occur. And what we find, of course, is that a lot of capital is now put to investment in the built environment. Uh, a built environment for production, the built environment for consumption, uh, consumption both in terms of active consumption, but also the creation of built environments for contemplation and uh, beauty and all, all, all the rest of it. So that uh, there is, uh, therefore, the building of places, the building of, 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 of spatial relations, and, and, and so on. So these are contextual conditions within which a capitalist mode of production operates. And, and the contextual conditions uh, can, at a certain point, uh, create uh, difficulties for the capitalist mode of production. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, we start to find that a uh, you know, contextual condition uh, like global warming, which is produced by, through capital accumulation and through uh, accumulation of capital over time and the increasing mass of output and product and all the rest of it, and we end up with uh, global warming, and global warming then creates uh, you know, hurricanes and it creates wildfires and then floods and tornadoes and all the rest of it. And so we see uh, an increasing risk of environmental damage, which is coming out of uh, what, what the capitalist mode of production has created. So there's a relationship then between what's going on in the capitalist mode of production, where we, we find that Marx will say a uh, capitalist mode of production is about accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake. That is, it's about the constant increase of mass production. And mass production means mass consumption. And that see, means more stresses in the environment. So that we're going to find the degradation of the environment. The, the, the uh, uh, species habitats disappear. Uh, we find that, that there are various tipping points in, in environmental degradation so that uh, productive soils suddenly become unproductive because they have been mined, uh, soil mined, uh, through uh, aggressive kind of uh, ag agricultural practices. So, uh, for instance, in the history of the cotton industry and the cotton production in the United States, initially when the cotton industry set up, 
It was with very little in the way of uh, artificial fertilizers and all the rest of it. And so the soil was just used again and again until the soil degradation became such that soil erosion and, 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 and degradation occurred. And so the cotton industry moved further westwards. So we actually see historically cotton moving westwards in the United States uh, because of, uh, uh, of this sort of uh, degradation of the environment. And then at a certain point, people said, well, you know, we can't continue this way, so therefore we have to re-change re uh, the nature of the, of the agricultural practices, introduce artificial fertilizers and so on. But artificial fertilizers end up polluting waters and creating algae in waters. And so we get, we, we get a whole set of relationships with, uh, uh, through uh, the environment which are, which are highly, highly significant. Uh, in terms of both human health and human capacities and powers at the same time as they at a certain point uh, create situations in which uh, once uh, something is exhausted um, uh, you will find uh, that uh, that exhaustion uh, will lead to a certain crisis of capital for example uh, in the 19th century, uh, there was a great deal of concern about agricultural uh, productivity uh, and uh, fertility, and it was understood that uh, maybe one of the major sources that could uh, contemplate, uh, could, could deal with that was the production of guano, guano being uh, the deposits made by birds in caves and so on. So the guano from Peru and, and so on suddenly gets spread over the fields all in Europe. Uh, but at a certain point, all the guano disappears. So at that point, we start to find artificial fertilizers come in. And uh, so, 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 so what I'm talking about here is <clears throat> an evolving relationship between what is happening in the capitalist mode of production and what is happening in the capitalist social formation. And the capitalist social formation uh, is not simply about what it is that capital makes, it's about also there are naturally occurring things. Now, to the degree to which, uh, for instance, uh, viruses and so on, like COVID, uh, are simply a, 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 a mutation in nature, uh, which occurs without any sort of input of human, of human activity. Many people, I think, would doubt that now and would say, well, some of the mutations which occur uh, and become significant, uh, become significant because human activity has actually uh, put together uh, environmental conditions under which uh, new mutants and new virals uh, configurations are likely to come about because and, and that's a very good reason why many of the things that have come about in the last few years have come from from East Asia and from China in particular and it has a lot to do with the intensity of environmental transformation that has occurred in China and uh, it's quite possible that we would say that uh, the, the the creation of an event like uh, COVID-19 is, uh, uh, I think, uh, not it just did not occur outside of the sphere of, of a certain amount of human influence in terms of how and when it occurred. Now, having said that, I don't want to make it seem like everything that occurs occurs because of something that human beings do. But human beings are active agents in 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 the environment. And to the degree that they're active agents, they play their role, and that role may be problematic in certain ways, as we clearly see in the case of global global warming. So the social formation, then, is one in which we have to look at the conditions under which capital accumulation can work, because now we we're finding capital accumulation has to work uh, in a context where the social form, conditions of the social formation, which are largely determined by the expansion of uh, capital accumulation, that these conditions uh, create uh, dangers and difficulties for the continuation of, uh, of capital accumulation. So we have all of that uh, where uh, we are not, we're, which is going on, and so we've got a, a transformation of the social formation by, by impulses coming from the 
from the, the mode of production, but at the same time the mode of production uh, is, is being uh, hindered or, or aided by certain transformations in the social formation in general in terms of the actual environmental conditions. Now, the second area of, it concerns human populations. That is, capital tends to take for granted the fact that there's a labor, uh, a, a, a labor supply out there. And it takes for granted the fact that that labor supply is, is adequate to the expansion of capital. And that, uh, that, 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 that one of the first things we notice, and one of the things that Marx makes much of in the Grundrisse, is that the expansion of uh, the population is a necessary condition uh, for the increasing supply of labor, which is a necessary condition for the increasing mass of output and uh, increasing accumulation of capital. Uh, now that means that uh, you have to look at the whole kind of uh, nature of human populations as a sort of resource upon which uh, capital relies in order to uh, you know, accumulate uh, wealth and power through through uh, through production. So this this is in exactly the same way that we see we talk about this in the environment. We find that capital actually affects, of course, social reproduction. If, for example capital decides that it doesn't want to pay anything in taxes and therefore it doesn't want to actually educate the labor force and, and spend money on health care and uh, decent uh, living conditions and so on. If, if capital kind of uh, decides you know, that it wants to minimize its tax burden and all the rest of it, uh, then we find that the conditions of social reproduction uh, are seriously affected and the qualities of labor supply go down and down and down to the point where it becomes almost unusable from the standpoint of capital. And some of that went on during the uh, 19th century in particular, that uh, capital didn't really care about what was the living conditions of the, of the mass of the workers. All they cared about was that they could turn up to, to work the next day. And if they didn't turn up to work next day because they were sick, somebody else would come in and take their place. And if they died early in life and their life expectancy was only 35 years old, capital didn't care as long as there was a huge uh, uh, surplus of labor out there in rural areas that could be sort of proletarianized. So the capital is actually feeding off, uh, if you like, the human resources. But at a certain point, we also find that capital starts to feed off the knowledge of those, uh, those populations. Those artisans had skills. Uh, capital started to use those skills to make things so that when capital came up and decided to you know, when certain capitalists came up and decided they were going to make steam engines, they found some laborers who knew how to make those things. <clears throat> so, so at this point, uh, suddenly, uh, capital kind of says, I, I "Actually, we need a, a skilled labor force." So, therefore, they start to put money into education and, and, and education of the workforce, and, and education and skills, and so, you know, trade schools and uh, and, and technical schools and all those. Kinds kinds of things and training facilities and so on start to become very, very significant. So again, the demands from within the mode of production on the human population become significant. At the same time as the, what the human population, what's happening with the human population becomes also significant. Uh, and even in terms of, you know, of their labor qualities, but also in terms of the consumer demands. And here too, uh, capital at a certain point has to, if it's going to have mass production, it has to have mass consumption. It has to induce the working class uh, and workers to actually consume and it has to pay the workers enough to make sure that they consume uh, the kinds of mass products that exist there. And again, uh, there are all sorts of things that go on here in terms of cultures of consumption, cultures of, uh, uh, of speed up, of turnover time, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, fashion industry and so on, that you, you change your clothing every year and you change this all the time. So you get, you get again, a, a, a lot of relations which go on between the capitalist mode of production, which is the inner structure of what a capitalist society is about and what is going on in the social formation, which is a very, very, very broad 
uh, kind of set of issues, uh, including, of course, the whole kind of uh, fact that uh, you know workers want want some autonomy in terms of their own lifestyle. Uh, they have, may want autonomy in terms of their religious beliefs, in terms of their cultural habits and so on, so that we find again a very complicated relationship between the social formation and between the mode of production. And in the same way uh, that I wouldn't want to sort of try to speculate on the, the nature of, of human uh, health without recognizing the relationship between what's going on inside of individual bodies and what's going on in the society at large. So I would want to say that at a certain point, it's very vital that we understand closely uh, the relationship between the, so the mode of production which Marx is, 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 is primarily concerned with and what is going on in the social formation uh, in terms of both the, the environment, uh, environmental conditions and also the social and cultural history and the fact that capital has a big impact upon the nature of culture and that culture has a big impact on capital and that capital exploits culture and that culture exploits capital. And so there's a, there, there's a much bigger issue here and, and within the social formation, of course, we find uh, the whole kind of question of the, na the different nature of cultural histories uh, and the, 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 the long-lasting consequences of a lot of that history. I think the whole question of, for example, the, 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 the effect of slavery uh, on black populations in the Atlantic economy and all that happened then still is terribly important in terms of uh, exactly how uh, things have worked out in the United States and in North America and in Latin America as well. So that, again, there is a long history to be looked at there. So I wanted to make very clear that when I start to talk about the mode of production, I'm isolating the mode of production uh, from the, its context in the social formation. But at the end of the day, I need to take into account a lot of what the social formation is about. Marx does this brilliantly on occasion. And, and, and has all sorts of insights onto the on the relationship between the two. But I want to make clear that in terms of my own analysis, I'm, I'm really following Marx in trying to distinguish between what is a mode of production about and what is a social formation about. And that at the end of the day, we need to put the two together. Uh, again, I use an analogy here, you know, that. Uh, it's a bit like uh, if, if, if capitalism is like one big ocean liner, one of those big, you know, kind of cruise ships, uh, then down in, down in the engine room there is a, there is a, uh, there is a mode, of, mode of, uh, of, of propulsion, and, and which is like the mode of production. The sorts of things that are going on on the different floors and different classes up above are happening. But if the mode of production doesn't work, uh, then we are in real trouble. At the same time, uh, the way the mode of production works has very, very, very clear implications for the way the social formation evolves. And to some degree, it exaggerates some of the, the differentiations that exist within the social formation and uses those differentiations as, as part of mobilizing its actual political power. And that, again, is going to some, be something that is going to be very much part of my consideration in talks to come.